All right. So diploidy, um, that means that we carry two alleles for each locus, for each gene, basically. Um, and of course, when we're talking about complete dominance, what that means is that there's going to be one dominant allele and there's also one recessive allele, but the dominant allele hides the recessive alleles. Um, but they can still show up. So let's say that two individuals who are both heterozygous, meaning they have one dominant and one recessive allele. If they mate, there's a 25% chance that their offspring will have two recessive alleles. And so that means that for their offspring, that genetic variation is going to come out. It's going to come out a little bit more than it, it would have or than it does in the parents. Um, so heterozygotes can carry recessive alleles that are hidden. You don't see them. Um, they don't have any effect on their on the phenotype, but they can still end up coming out in the offspring. So this this means that there's an increased chance of genetic variation. It's a play in a concept called heterozygote advantage. Heterozygote advantage occurs when heterozygotes have a higher fitness than do both homozygotes. So that means that they're able to survive and reproduce better than an individual who, who is homozygous dominant and better than an individual who is homozygous recessive. Um, the classic example of heterozygote advantage is sickle cell anemia versus malaria. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But just make sure you get down, just write down the definition of heterozygote advantage. I'm done. All right. So when we think about sickle cell anemia, um, it's a mutation in the gene for hemoglobin. Now this is what this is a um, it's a simple substitution mutation, and it only affects a single nucleotide. So we talked about this. We did that gizmo that kind of walked you through the impacts of mutations. But it literally, this mutation is a result of just one messed up nucleotide. And it can cause, you know, humongously damaging effects. But people who have this mutation um, have red blood cells that are not shaped like bowls, but they're shaped like sickles, which kind of look like a half moon. And this means that those red blood cells, which are responsible for transporting oxygen, are no longer good at doing that. Uh, it causes the red blood cells to clump together, which is extremely painful, especially in the extremities where um, the blood vessels are already pretty small, pretty thin. So when the red blood cells are clumping together, they can clot those blood vessels, which can be very painful. Um, and the blood cells can also literally break, which means that they're no longer capable of carrying oxygen at all. Um, this oftentimes not only is painful, but leads to a very premature death. So not a good thing, sickle cell anemia. But sickle cell anemia is only, it's, it's the recessive trait. So in order to get it, you need to have two recessive alleles. You need to be homozygous recessive. And so what we're thinking is that, of course, if this is such a bad thing, and if it causes death before the reproductive age, then we should be seeing very, very few humans who end up getting sickle cell anemia because it should be wiping itself out if it's killing people before it before they're having kids because you can't pass it on. You can't pass that mutation on. But 
in certain areas of the world where there are high rates of malaria, we see that this sickle cell anemia allele, the recessive allele that causes this mutation, is actually still around and it's around in quite high numbers. Um, there was a scientist named Tony Allison who was able to show that having a single copy of that sickle cell anemia, that sickle cell allele protects against malaria. So if you are homozygous dominant, that means that you do not have sickle cell anemia. But it also means that in these areas of the world, you are much more likely to get sick with malaria, which is caused by a bacteria, a, par a parasite um, that invades the red blood cells. But if you have sickle cell anemia, you cannot really get malaria, or at least you won't have a very you won't have a very um, severe experience with it because again, this parasite is affecting the red blood cells. But if your red blood cells are already damaged by sickle cell anemia, then um, it, they won't really be susceptible to this, to this parasite. The parasite can't really have any impact on them. So what we're seeing is that individuals who are homozygous dominant don't get sickle cell but they do have really bad experiences with malaria and can sometimes die. Individuals who do have, who are homozygous recessive, do have sickle cell anemia, but they can't get malaria, but the sickle cell will also often cause them to die. It's the heterozygotes. These people have one dominant allele and one recessive allele. The dominant allele means that they don't have sickle cell anemia because sickle cell is a recessive trait. But the recessive allele means that some of their red blood cells are actually shaped like sickles, which means that some of their red blood cells um, are not going to be as impacted by the malaria parasite. And once the body kind of recognizes that this malaria has invaded it, it will actually start to destroy its red blood cells. But in the case of these people who have the sickle cell, when those red blood cells that are sickle shaped get destroyed, it actually is a good thing. So this has led to nature selecting for sickle cell anemia because it protects certain people from malaria. It says a heterozygous baby born in an area with a high incidence of malaria has a 26% better chance of surviving their birth and childhood than a baby that is homozygous for normal hemoglobin. Interesting. 26% better chance. So if you're heterozygous, meaning you, you carry the allele for sickle cell, but you don't actually have it yourself, you have a 26% better chance of surviving malaria. Fascinating. And here are the areas of the world where we see malaria being pretty common. If you see these, these dots, the black dots, um, typically we do associate it with Western Africa, but as we can see anywhere along the equator, we see it in Yemen, which is right here. We see it, of course, in India and Pakistan and Iran and Iraq. Um, we see it in Eastern Asia, Cambodia, Laos, um, Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam. We see it in Madagascar as well. And the places where we see a lot of malaria, of course, is being carried by mosquitoes. Um, we also see that the frequencies of the sickle cell allele are much higher. In some cases, like if we're looking here, I believe this is probably Angola. It might be Namibia. Um, we're seeing, in some cases, 25%. The, the sickle cell allele is appearing in 25% of the population. So it's quite, quite remarkable. And then you can see it's literally, and it, it, it's, it appears in 0% of the population or in less than 2.5% of the population in most places. Um, north of the equator and even in South Africa. All right. Last slide. Um, I would encourage you to just write these down, these four points, why natural selection cannot fashion perfect organisms. The first two are kind of the same thing. Selection can only act on existing variations. What that means is that um, natural selection is going to choose the allele. It's going to select for the allele 
that provides the advantage. It's going to select for traits that give some type of um, fitness advantage, but it can only select for traits that already exist. So it's not like you know nature can decide can decide for us that it would be best if human beings start to have the ability to fly. That's not gonna, or if we had to develop the de develop the ability to develop gills. That's just not gonna happen because we don't have the trait to do that. So it can only act on variations that are already existing. Evolution is limited by historical constraints. So um, this goes back, back to something we'll talk more about in the coming days, but we, we have common ancestors. And so if we look at our ancestors and see the traits that they have, uh, it's difficult for new traits to arise out of nowhere. So this is why I said number one is very similar. Basically, they're both saying um, natural selection can only choose what has already been there. Number three, adaptations are also often compromises. For example, um, obviously human beings, we have these remarkably dexterous um, digits. We can move our fingers, we can rotate our hands and our wrists. Um, you know, we have a great amount of mobility in our extremities. Unfortunately, the compromise of that is that our bodies are not very stable. Our structure is not as, as, not as strong as it could be. So we often end up with torn ligaments or um, ruptured tendons. We also end up straining muscles. So uh, whereas other organisms are much more sturdy, but they don't have the flexibility that we have. We think about a turtle. A turtle is a very, very sturdy organism. Um, there are no tendons or ligaments that are going to be ripped. It's got this hard shell on its outside, but it's not nearly as flexible as human beings are. So uh, there, when, we, when we, you know, human beings obviously benefited in many ways from the ability to be flexible. It gave us the ability to stand upright. It gives us the ability to, to run. It makes, uh, most mammals are a little bit more flexible because of the way that we're born. It gives us the opportunity to be uh, born almost fully developed and we can still fit outside of, you know, get out of the mother's womb. But at the same time, uh, as we develop these adaptations, we became a little less sturdy. So it's a compromise. And then of course, chance, natural selection and the environment interact. So, you know, there might be a baby born tomorrow with a specific specific mutation that makes it impossible for them to ever get HIV. That probably has already happened. Um, and that's just a random event. You know, they might, that person has some type of mutation that means that their cells do not have a receptor that can take in the human immunodeficiency virus. That means that they are immune to HIV. That's a totally random event. We, nobody designed that, you know, that, that mutation came out of nowhere. Um, but we, we, we say that the environment is interacting as well because that person might never ever find out that they have that mutation that prevents them from having HIV. Hopefully, hopefully they don't because to do so means you'd have to be exposed to HIV. Um, and then natural selection also has a, has a role as well because, uh, you know, over time, we would hope to see that that mutation would be spread throughout the population because it would be selected for. But we might not ever see that happening because, again, we wouldn't know that it's there. All right. So um, there are there is no such thing as a perfect organism for these reasons. All right. Okay, let's see, let's see. Okay, so now we need to talk about the evidence that exists for evolution. You don't need to write any, I'll tell you when I'll tell you when you need to write, but I'm just gonna talk for now. So um, of course, Charles Darwin is kind of considered the father of 
evolution or he at least the progenitor of evolution but um he never actually used the term evolution um that doesn't appear in his books um he, he really talked about what's called descent with modification and we'll talk more about that but his ideas came from his studies of fossils and by studying fossils he was able to see similarities between living species and species that are now extinct. Of course, and this is a good thing to know, you don't need to write it down, but I, I, I have seen AP questions about this. When we are excavating the earth, what we of course find is that the older stratum, the layers of the earth, are the earth that are deeper down are the oldest strata. And that means that they also have the older fossils, the fossils of organisms that were alive billions of years ago. The younger strata are nearer the top of the Earth's crust. So you have to do less digging to get these and you'll find more recent fossils there. So that's kind of common sense. And strata is a plural word, just meaning layers. A singular strata is called a stratum. Okay. Skipping ahead here. Let's see what is all this? Oh no 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 no! You don't need to know this. Okay. So descent with modification. Again, I'll tell you when to write. Descent with modification by natural selection explains the adaptations of organisms and the unity and diversity of life. So. Uh, some doubt about the permanence of species preceded Darwin's ideas. So he was already having, and not just him, but the scientific community at the time, was already doubtful of the idea that species have always existed as they currently do. Um, there was already this idea that things probably have changed over time. But at the same time, we see these common characteristics appearing um, across many very diverse life forms. In biology, we talk about the acronym Sternger. Um, synthesis, transport, excretion, respiration, nutrition, growth and development, regulation and reproduction. We see those same eight essential life processes across many, many different forms of life that really have nothing to do with one another. And so the idea starts to arise, why do we see such commonalities between very, very foreign species? Why is it that a bacteria needs to do essentially the same thing that a human being needs to do, uh, which is to reproduce, to find a source of nutrition, um, to have some type of specialization taking place in the body or inside of the organism. So why, was, why is that happening? Um, and so this is where Darwin kind of makes his name. And I'm not gonna go through this entire history. Um, so, his, and his ideas, based on his observations that he made on uh, the Galapagos Islands, which are just off the coast of Chile, what he was thinking is that, or what he was seeing is that organisms oftentimes are going to adapt to their environment. They end up developing traits and phenotypes that allow them to be best suited for their environment. And this is what we've been talking about. This is that idea of adaptive evolution. Okay, so then he writes his essay on natural selection as the mechanism of descent with modification, but he did not introduce his theory publicly. So natural selection is defined as a process in which individuals with favorable inherited traits are more likely to survive and reproduce. So again, they're favorable because they make them a better fit for their environment. They make it easier for them to fend off predators or they make it easier for them to be camouflaged from predators. They make it easier for them to find prey or to you know, have access to certain types of foods. All of this means it's gonna be more likely that they survive. And if it's more likely that you survive, it's also more likely that you reproduce as well. So his theories help to explain three broad observations, the unity of life, the diversity of life, and the match between organisms and their environment. What do you think it means when we say the unity of life? What does that mean? 
because I mean, like, all the elements are white. Um, say a little bit more. Like they all come together to make life? Uh, not quite. What he's thinking about here is that, like, like I was saying earlier, the life forms that we know currently exist share many common commonalities. We have many traits in common with one another um, that you might not expect. So this is what he means by the, the unity of life. So again, he never uses the word evolution. Instead, he uses this phrase, descent with modification. And the phrase refers to the view that all organisms are related through descent from an ancestor that lived in the remote past. So this is uh, a foundational concept that is now, you know, rest at the very foundation of evolution. This idea that we have all evolved from this common ancestor, this singular life form. And over the course of billions of years, um, as life has spread out, as life has been exposed to various environments, as the environment has changed, we see more diversity, greater diversity in life forms. So this gives you the idea of a tree that branches outward. Let's see, here are some of his earlier notes, I guess. Here's, again, this idea of the tree. Okay, so <clears throat> here's the common ancestor. Of course, today, we the only formats of these organisms that we see are these elephants, the Asian elephant, the African elephant, or some specific species that lives only in Africa, and then another specific species that lives only in Africa. Mammoths are extinct, stegodons are extinct, but you can see they, they clearly have some sim similarities between currently living elephants. And here are all of those organisms' common ancestors which were uh, around 60 million years ago, but have now gone extinct, except for manatees. Manatees are still around. Um, yeah, we're not gonna look at this. We talked about this. What I wanted to get to was, yeah. So evolution is supported by an overwhelmingly or an overwhelming amount of scientific evidence. Now, this is always the idea. People have certain spiritual and religious beliefs that don't allow them to accept evolution as a reality. And, you know, I don't think I'm in a position to be an authority on that. And I don't think you are. And I don't, I'm not sure that anyone is. We, we have no exact certain proof that evolution is true and that it, it represents exactly what actually has happened over the last billions of years. Even if, you know, we don't even know for certain, for certain that Earth is billions of years, but we do have a lot of evidence of these things. Um, and if you kind of collect the evidence and if you analyze the evidence, then more likely than not, you will arrive at this conclusion that evolution is the likely, and natural selection is the likely mechanism for life as we know it on, plant, on, on the earth. Okay, so one type, uh, and this is, what I'm, this is where I'm gonna ask, ask you to start writing. One type of evidence that we rely on is called homology, and this is the similarity resulting from common ancestry. Homo, of course, means same. Homology is therefore what we see about organisms that make them the same.
So of course there are homologous structures and these are anatomical resemblances that represent variations on a structural theme. And the, that theme was present in a common ancestor. So basically this is just similar anatomy. <laughs> I'm good. So here are examples of homology structures. <clears throat> we can see this across different mammal species. So whales, of course, are aquatic mammals, and bats are uh, mammals that can fly. But we see these same structures in the limbs of mammals. So there's a humerus. Well, this is what we call them in, in humans. There's a humerus bone that's represented in this purple color. We can see it appearing in these other species. It is typically the bone that is connecting the distal portion of the arm to the main trunk of the body. So in a cat, again, it's connecting the, the distal portion of the arm, which is the part that's kind of further away from the trunk of the body to the actual trunk of the body. Same thing with whales and bats. We see two bones um, in the more distal portion of the arm. And we see that in, in the other species as well, even though we might not expect to see two bones. So the ulna bone is not necessarily the most important bone in, you know, in, your, in your arm, but we do see it in different species as well. Probably as a remnant of the fact that we once walked on all fours, as you can see, it's much more prominent in a cat. And you can see how very small it is in a bat. We can see carpals, which typically are the bones of the wrist, but we see that those same bones. And actually, um, I don't know that you can tell here, but they are actually the same number of carpals in these mammals as well, which is kind of odd. Um, we see metacarpals, which make up basically in humans, our hand, the actual palm of your hand. We see metacarpals in other species as well. Bats actually have five of them. And then also we see phalanges, which are your actual fingers. So interestingly enough, we see these homologous structures. And of course there are others as well, homologous structures in terms of organ systems and in terms of this, the nervous system. Comparative embryology is another type of homology that allows us to study similarities between species. And this means that we're literally looking at embryos. I don't know if there's a picture for this. I guess so, yeah. Yeah, so the way that embryos develop is quite similar across species. It's not super important there. And then we can even look at molecular homologies. So looking at similarities between genes and proteins that have been inherited from a common ancestor. I think I do want you to write that down, so I'll go back in a second. But okay, so percent of amino acids that are identical to the amino acids in a human hemoglobin polypeptide. So hemoglobin, again, is that protein that allows our red blood cells to transport oxygen. 
Um, other organisms, of course, need the ability to transport oxygen in their blood. Um, and they have some version of hemoglobin. It's gonna be a slightly different protein than what humans have, but they have some version of it. And we see based on basically how, how distantly related the organism is that their hemoglobin is more or less similar to humans. So a rhesus monkey, which is of course a relatively similar um, close ancestor of humans, their hemoglobin is 95% similar to human hemoglobin, at least in terms of the amino acids that comprises it. We get all the way down to a lamprey, a lamprey, lamprey, I think it's lamprey. Um, it's only 14% similar. Okay, so that's molecular homologies. I do want you to write that one down. Oh, gosh. I'm down here. Okay. All right. Uh, we and then we did talk about this. This is when organisms convergent evolution is when organisms and located in very different places and that are actually distantly related start to develop similar characteristics. So we see this sugar glider and all the way in Australia, developing very similar techniques of movement to the flying squirrel that we might see in Western uh, North America. Other evidence of evolution is the fossil record. And we talked about this as well. Um, but we can see that most mammals have very similarly shaped ankle bones. This is um, probably a metatarsal. Okay, so the fossil record is important. Um, we also use the fossil record to, to document transitions. So the transition from land to sea is one of the most important transitions in evolution. How did organisms how are they first able to survive in, with such a different environment? Think about being able to leave the water and going to live terrestrially, living on land. That's a very, very different environment and requires different anatomies. So if we can discover fossils that tell us a little bit about what adapt adaptations led to that ability, it can be quite helpful to us. Okay, um, let's see, hold on. All right, that's it. So biogeography, this is the last point. The geographic distribution of species provides evidence of evolution. So 
Earth's continents were formerly, formerly united in a single large continent called Pangaea, but they've since separated as a result of continental drift. An understanding of continent movement and modern distribution of species allows us to predict when and where different groups evolved. Um, I'm not sure what the Wallace line is. You want me to write all of this? No. Um, I would just say write the definition of biogeography. Interesting. I'm done. Okay. Um, well, that's all I wanted to get through today. So I'm glad that we were able to do it all. We only we do have a few more lessons in this unit. Um, I'm not sure that we'll be able to finish it before spring break, but I am going to give you all. It will be part assignment, but more so study guide um, that we'll be able to use because we only have about a little like a month and a half left before the AP exam. Uh, the district has not yet decided exactly what schedule they're going to follow with the AP exam because College Board has provided a few different op options. Um, really, we only have two options because the third option that the College Board provided would require us to take the AP exam after the school year ends, which they're not going to force anybody to do. So we're kind of deciding between two schedules. One of them would be like in the first two weeks of May. Uh, and then the second option would be weeks three and four of May. So we don't know exactly when the test will be, but as soon as I know, I will let you all know. But either way, we only have somewhere between a month and a month and a half left, and we've got one more unit. So um, we need to really start focusing our efforts on review at this point. So I'm gonna, I don't wanna give you all an assignment because I want you to be able to chill and both of you need to you know, start or continue applying for scholarships and stuff like that um, over spring break. But I do want you all to have some method of reviewing. So be on the lookout for that. But other than that, I will let you go. And I hope you have a good weekend. And I hope you do not stress over whatever the decision is. But I will be I will be hoping only the best for it. Thank you, Mr. Um, bye. See you Monday. OK, see you Monday.